Alright, hello everyone. A while back, I discussed with my Twitch viewers about making a video from a bunch of stream highlights, answering questions, and giving some tips and more about Grid 2. After taking multiple months of stream footage, <laughs> about seven months to be exact, I uh, slowly worked on sorting through and selecting clips to use for this video. Sadly, as I slowly worked on this video project, I noticed that Grid 2 and its DLCs were taken off the Steam store for unknown reasons. I mean, to be fair, it's probably for car or music licenses expiring, or maybe they're just trying to make a pathway for Grid 2019. Honestly, who knows? But at the time of making this video, Grid 2 is still available to get from other online stores, just not Steam. And I think some, the DLC is on some online stores as well. I think I've seen it on Green Man Gaming, for example. But still, you know, as this happened with, you know, the Steam store, a part of me was like, this is kicking a balls to me making this video. Because, like, a part of me was like, maybe I should not even make this video now. I mean, there's going to be less and less people getting the game now since it's got... Since it got pulled from the Steam store. But I've been waiting to make a video like this for a while, and I just wanted to see what kind of reaction I would get from it. In all honesty, though, too, this video would have been really useful for new players during the Humble Bundle sale or deal or whatever you want to call it that happened earlier in the year. In case you don't know what the Humble Bundle sale deal was, essentially they gave away Grid 2 for free for a short time with two DLCs. But regardless, you know, I wanted to do it earlier, but uh, but I also felt like that I didn't have enough stream footage to make the video at that earlier time. So the video was put on hold for a little while longer. Now to uh, jump into more talking about the video, it's a labor of love, and I'll be honest, at times I had issues deciding on which clip is better at explaining this feature or that race type, for example. Because of this, there might be a few segments where the same thing is pretty much explained multiple times, just kind of with different wording, <laughs> because I couldn't decide which take I liked better, for example, but also along with this, I also sometimes fought with myself on the placement of these segments. Should I put this before this? Should we talk about drift events before I talk about time attacks? Kind of as an example of that. So some of the subjects might be out of order, or there's just some clips like I'm like, where the hell am I going to put this in the video? Also, due to the nature of pulling most of the footage from streams, explanations of some things are not always perfect for everything, and a couple mistakes were made. So, editing Wes <laughs> might appear randomly throughout the video to correct something or say something I forget about. Or I'll just put text on the screen talking about, you know, a correction, too. But anyway, I hope you enjoy this video that has been in uh, the video ideas for a while. If there is something that is not covered or explained in this video... Uh, ask in the comments below, or uh, come to a Twitch stream and just ask me. I don't bite. <laughs> and I will try my best to explain it, of course. To start this video, this video only covers stuff from the multiplayer. No single player discussion mainly because I haven't played it since like 2014, 2015. Like it's seriously been that long, like when I first bought the game. But for context for the beginning of the video, around when the Humble Bundle was happening... I completed another level 99 multiplayer profile, and I started a new one and tried to do a rough, and yes, it was certainly rough. Some stuff I just completely cut out altogether, but it was a rough take of uh, explaining some beginner stuff for Grid 2, and then started using other clips from other streams after that, for the most part, except like one thing where I talked about custom events, I think it was, and I decided to use... Stuff from more newer streams to replace what I said in this rough take. So, enjoy the video, and I hope to see you on a future Twitch stream. Link is in the description for the Twitch channel for those who are interested. And be sure to check out the Personal Best spreadsheet if you're curious about my lap times and more on certain tracks. It's not complete, and it's missing a good bit of data still, but... Honestly, I'm going to stop rambling on now, and I'm just going to start the video, so enjoy, everybody. So let's begin. Start a new game. 
And I can overwrite one of them if I'd like to. Let's just overwrite this other one I have here. I'll be honest, I haven't played on this profile in a while, so let's just overwrite it. Alright, folks. This is going to be a brand new save, and I'm going to try to go through... Like, a mini-tutorial, we'll say. Welcome to Grid 2 Online, a unique and separate game area from the career mode. Unlocked cars, customizations, and progress earned here are completely unique to the online game mode. That is correct. Take a look around, and we'll explain each area of the garage as you reach it. As the narrator says, the career progression and the multiplayer progression are completely separate. There's two separate stats for both of them. So starting off, what I want to go through with you guys is... First off, I'll go through some controls here. In case there's any new players, new viewers, or anything. I'm the weirdo that drives automatic on an Xbox 360 controller. So, hey, we're going to keep that the same. One thing you, wanna, might, you might want to assign is there's a button for push to talk. I usually set that up every time I do it. And since it's a new save, i got to reconfigure it anyway, so... Here we are. But anyway, these are the default configuration for the controller layout for an Xbox 360 controller like mine. And you can configure these any way you'd like, from my understanding. I usually keep it pretty default, but just because that's what I'm used to from playing the game all these years. One thing I want to mention to you is if you never if you just jump straight into multiplayer and you never play any of the career, there is one feature I like to tell you new players about. There's a thing called flashbacks. Essentially, flashbacks are a way to reset your car after a crash or, you know, whatever happens. But these flashbacks are extremely useful in lobbies where a pileup could happen or whatever could happen. A lot of crashes and collisions can be avoided using these flashbacks as well. So... Also, if you play like the first 15 or so minutes of uh, the career, it'll get, it'll explain flashbacks a little bit more, but that's just the rough and quick uh, explanation of it. Okay, so going into the next discussion, we're going to talk about cars. Upgrade your car to modify its performance and handling characteristics. Some cars can be upgraded into the next tier, which is sometimes cheaper than buying a new car in the tier above. Like he says... Here's where you can upgrade your cars. You can also customize the livery of your car, the decals, the layout of your design on your car. Now, since you're level one, which I'm guessing you all are going to be just like I am right now, just to you know explain things to newer viewers and players alike. Um, a lot of the things, customizations and whatnot, you're gonna you're not gonna have right away. I'll be honest with you. There's a DLC pack on Steam. It's called the Car Unlocked DLC. Because of that, I legitimately have every car unlocked because of it. But you can't do upgrades on them yet. But besides that, let me go back into... Each tier has one car they give you that you can upgrade from level 1 as long as you have enough money. Tier 1 being this Alfa Romeo Giulietta, which... That's what we call it. We call it the Julieta. At least my friends and I call it that. I'm pretty sure that's not how it's pronounced, but that's how we pronounce it. We're weird. But this is a car you can upgrade on level 1. Like, literally, I can go into upgrades and apply them. Hello, guys. Editing Wes here. <laughs> so I am about done with this video edit, actually. And I'm going through the whole video again and was like, let's play a game. So I've noticed that I apparently say the word literally a lot. Like, I'm not kidding, it's a lot. <laughs> so I thought, let's make a little fun guessing game out of this before everybody watches the whole video, including myself, because I'm gonna, you know, like I said, I'm rerunning through it all to uh, adjust some things that I might have missed if there is any. But because of that, I also want to make a guess myself at the amount of times I say literally before I actually make the counter, like, the pop-ups, the text that, you know, for the counter. So let me know your guys' guesses in the comments below. And let's see how close we all get, honestly. <laughs> so uh, my guess is going to be 45. But <laughs> anyway, back to the video. And oh, and before I forget, 
here is a counter for number one for the sentence I said before I paused the video. Now you got to keep in mind, when you're applying upgrades on cars, you see this tier thing right here, where my mouse is? There's a bar here, it progresses. The blue means that's what's going to be increased on this car, you know. The tier level is going to be higher, you're going to get better acceleration, you're going to get a little more power. What you want to do with a lot of these cars, like the announcer says, you can upgrade them the whole way to tier 2 if you'd like to. Or the tier above, as he worded it, which is a better way of wording it, because there's all these different cars and whatnot. But there's a lot of cars it doesn't really super, it's not super beneficial to go to the next tier and up. My opinion, of course. And to be fair as well, I don't use this car as my main car. I use the Camaro Z28 in Tier 1. That's my like main car I use when I usually play. So the tunes for this car can't really... I can't really recommend any, personally, because I don't use it. So it's like me... <laughs> Think of a quick analogy, Wes. What would be a quick, dirty, good analogy to explain this <laughs> i'm done with this car i can't explain what the best tune is it tune is for it because i don't use it because of this i actually asked some friends for some input on this turns out when you start off a new profile in your level one and you get five thousand currency that gives you just enough money to apply a three engine zero drive train one handling tune to this car and it just gives you enough money. Now, once you get a little bit more money, you can make it 302, and it's still under Tier 2. And then I also have another friend. He actually uses two engine, one drivetrain, two handling. And it still stays under Tier 2 as well. It's still technically a Tier 1. So there's two tunes uh, that you can do with the car. I thank my friends for uh, giving me a little input on this because, like I said, I don't use the car really, so I appreciate them. They know who they are. <laughs> but like I said, every car there's at least one car in every tier. I'm going to continue into this discussion. There's at least one car in every tier that you can upgrade at level one if you have enough money to do that. As we just showed that Alfa Romeo is the tier one car if you go to tier two there is a dodge uh challenger this one here this one can be upgraded at level one like you can see see i i can apply upgrades each car has an unlock level and then a level for when you can unlock upgrades as you can see this thing's level 10. and what i've noticed through the time i've been playing it seems like the upgrades get unlocked two levels after you unlock the car. But of course you have to unlock the car and I'm guessing you would have to pay for it unless you have the car unlocked DLC pack like I do. That's why I can access these cars because I have that DLC which it's like, I think it's like five US dollars or something. But anyway, uh, like I said, tier two, the car you can, up, un, bleh, you can apply upgrades to right away at level one if you have enough money. You only start out with $5,000, which I guess you can't really see because my thing's in the way. I'll show it to you just so you can see it. I'll move my camera. But yeah, in the top, upper left, that's how much money I have it currently. But I'll move it back just so you can see the upgrade stuff better. But yeah, like I said, you can apply upgrades on this. I think I remember people talking the tune two engine zero trend. Or, I'm sorry, zero drivetrain and three handling is what a lot of people use. To be fair, I use a different car just to start off because I have the car unlocked pack, so I just use what I'm comfortable with. Moving to tier three, there's four tiers. One being the lowest, four being the highest tier. Tier four having, like, the supercars and stuff in the game and whatnot. A lot of these cars I have here are actually from DLC as well. Like, practically this whole first section of cars, like, from here to the beginning, are literally DLC cars. There's a lot of drifting DLC. But the car you in Tier 3 you can start with is the Honda NSX-R, which is towards the end here. This car you can upgrade right at level 1. Like I said, if you have enough money to upgrade it. As you can see, a lot, every single upgrade is more than $5,000, which is all you start out with on a new save. So 
You can't upgrade this thing at the moment. But the thing I hate about this car is extremely sensitive to drive. Like, it will... You will lose control of it very easily. And that's one thing I hate about the car, because they want people to... New players to have a car to start off with. How about give them a car that doesn't slide all over the place <laughs> to start off? Because this thing is crazy to control, especially when you start applying upgrades to it. My personal opinion. Which I will be probably using an unupgraded uh, Corvette Z06. is main my one of my main preferred cars in Tier 3. Also, the Aerial Atom 3... Uh, once you can unlock, once you unlock upgrades, I run this as two engines, zero drivetrain, zero handling. It handles pretty well. It's also decently quick, and it's really grip. It has a decent amount of grip. It has, uh, I lost my train of thought. It has a decent amount of grip, but it also it's weird. It's a track car, but it slides. <laughs> it's like what? Also, another car I recommend for beginners that want more of a grippier car to start with in Tier 3 is the Caterham SP300R. Personally, I don't use this car, and holy crap, you can't do upgrades to it until level 22. Holy crap. <laughs> but I know some people that... There's a lot of people that use this car and really like it. I'm not one of them people. I like using it for a special type of uh, global challenge event, they're called. They're a separate online mode that allows you to essentially verse each other in leader online leaderboards. There's an event called Overtake Races, and grip cars are really helpful for them. Because you have to weave in and out of moving trucks on the track, and you get points and the more you pass, and the more you pass consistently without crashing or hitting one or whatever, you know. This also includes if you hit walls or you run off the track, you can lose your multiplier on your points as well. But I show a little bit more and I talk a little bit more about overtake events later in the video. But mainly, I wanted to record this extra commentary to say that I actually asked a friend what uh, the tune is for the Tier 3 Caterham. And he said uh, the one tune that he uses is a one engine, zero drivetrain, one handling tune on it. He says that's practically the only tune you can put on it that doesn't take it over Tier 3 to Tier 4. Last tier we got is Tier 4. A couple of these cars, like just like Tier 3, are DLC cars. To be fair, I know this one is. This is DLC, this is DLC. Actually, is that DLC? I'm really testing my memory right now because... I, when I first bought the game, I bought the... It's called the Reloaded Edition of the game, and it's literally all the DLCs included. Except for one DLC that was included, or that's given to everyone for free, so you have to download it yourself, and that's the uh, Demo Derby pack. It's free, but they don't include it in the Reloaded Edition, so sometimes when you go into a lobby... It'll say, oh, you don't have all the DLC required to play in this lobby. And it, nine times out of ten, it's probably because of that DLC that no one is told about, no one knows about, unless you literally go digging for it and figuring out that, oh, hey, that DLC is for free for everyone, and you have to download it manually. Which I don't understand why it's not included in the Reloaded Edition, but... <laughs> you know? <laughs> One of my favorite starter cars, I'll be honest, I've been using this thing a ton on my other save files. I have an upgraded two engine, one drivetrain, and one handling. Of course, it costs a lot of money because it's a tier four car, but upgrades are available right away. As you can see, they're very expensive, but hey, you got a decent tier four car to start off with. If you have that DLC anyway. But the car that you get automatically... I'm pretty sure is this Mercedes-Benz SLR McLaren 722. Everyone gets this car for free. Now hold on, Wes. They actually give you the car as a loaner car. That way you have a car to use in this tier. At least it's this way, unless you have some tier 4 DLC. Then you can choose that as well. But since it's a loaner car, they also take some of your earnings after every race. So. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially your climb through the first 30 levels is going to 
be kind of difficult because you want to try to get everything to unlock all the, you know, all the upgrades. Or I'm sorry, to unlock upgrades for all the cars that you want to drive. The max one being level 30 for this Conan Sega Guerra. It's level 30, I'm pretty sure. I was just say, please don't prove me wrong, because <laughs> that would suck. <laughs> and then you have two other DLC things for the Indy Car and Demo Derby, which I don't really include them. I don't usually, I never really do those game modes. They're just not for me. I don't like them. I can understand why some people would like them. I just, I'm not one of them people, personally. You can jump into events. You have three different choices. Online will take you into the online thing. How many hours do I have stacked already? I've played this game for thirteen over 1,300 hours. I have four completed level 99 multiplayer saves. And I can show it to you as well. Let me set up the uh, Steam overlay to show here. Just so I, I show you the proof that I'm not lying. Like if you look up here, 1329. But anyway, to go back into my explanation... <laughs> So we have online where you go and select online lobbies. Then you have global challenge. I briefly mentioned this earlier when we were talking about different cars and tunes and whatnot. I'll show it to you real quick here. Essentially, global challenge is essentially it's kind of an Welcome offline, and he's probably going to explain it too. Is powered by RaceNet. Be sure to visit RaceNet.com to track and share your progress. Just remember the first weekend cap was level 30. Yeah, go on. I don't remember that. Of course, I didn't have the game right at the beginning of the release. I I built a computer back in 2014. My first computer, anyway. And that was when I was interested in the game because it was also like $12.50 for the Reloaded Edition, which had all the DLCs and stuff. But essentially, Race Net, or RaceNet's Global Challenge. RaceNet is the backbone of literally all the online statistic tracking stuff. It has its flaws, too. So, And you might actually get to see one of the flaws now if one of the tracks are one of the tracks that are messed up and glitched. Essentially, Global Challenge is a weekly leaderboard where you face off against your friends and rivals set by RaceNet. You can also add custom RaceNet rivals yourself as well by going to their website for RaceNet. But, anyway, you're set with a bunch of random tracks that you can go across and play. What's really weird is, here's the bug I want to talk about, Cote d'Azur. As you can see, it's green. As you can see, it's green. As you can see, it's green. Unlike... <laughs> it's green? My god, am I colorblind? Really? It's green. <laughs> it sure looks like blue to me on my editing screen. <laughs> wow, Wes. You never cease to amaze me in your colorblindness when you're recording streams or something. <laughs> but... It's blue, from my knowledge. It's kind of purplish, but it's blue. It looks more blue. I don't know. I'm still colorblind, maybe. <laughs> well, let me zoom it in here for a second. Uh, well, it's kind of purple, but it's kind of blue. Even now editing this, I'm not really sure what it is. We're just going to call it blue, okay? Um, Yeah, back to the video, okay? <laughs> Unlike the other ones, which are white. That is because I apparently don't have the DLC, and it will say I require the DLC that I don't own. Here's the problem. I have all the DLC. I have the Reloaded Edition. There's nothing left to download. So, what am I missing? And that's been a bug with Global Challenge for a while. Some weeks you get one that is that DLC, and you can't play it. But anyway, we're going to jump into some online. Let's see if we can find something. So you have a couple choices. I didn't. I, I should have explained this. You have online custom events. These are custom events hosted by other people with their own settings that they configure in game in their own tracks. There's some things I don't like about glow or custom events. I mean, uh, custom events have this issue. You all right? Hold up. Uh, I just wanted to pause the video here and say that I actually put a different clip in here instead of the original clip. The original clip was. It was alright, but 
I decided to throw this other one in instead. I kind of liked it more. And I also decided to just throw the rest of the custom event segments together with it here. Just because, you know, we were starting to talk about custom events, I figured let's just put all the custom event clips together. That way it's all together in one spot of the video. So, uh, back to the video. Just jump in some online, see if we can find some everything playlists to play in. These are my favorites to race. You get a variety of different disciplines to play. Uh, compared to custom events where you can come in late, not get the amount of points you could get if you started at the beginning, whatever. All the things that I dislike about custom events. Kind of like if there's a series of four or five races and you come in at race three, and since custom events work kind of like a tournament point system, like 20 for first place, 16 for second, blah, blah. Because of that, You'll come in race three and there's people that have like 30 plus points and you're just getting points on that third race. So it's like you don't have a chance of even, I mean, if the, those points matter to you anyway, but I mean, it's kind of the mechanic of the custom event. So it's kind of weird. And also if you come in at like that race of three of five, whatever car you use last, you're going to have to use it because literally it doesn't let you select your car that you want to use either. So. T4 Cali Highway. <laughs> Pick out, bring out a Garrus too with that guy. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> Just so you know, Glock. Reading up right now is not worth it when the host is changing settings because it'll just reset you anyway. And it'll, it'll make you have to click it again. See, once it says... Once it starts doing the countdown in the upper right corner, now you can ready up and it'll actually be useful. It'll actually work this time because he applied all his settings and now it's worth readying up now. Or you can just let it run the whole way through it. It doesn't really matter. It's not like a big wait time. Uh, How do we change cars? We have to, we have to ready up first? Yeah, yeah once... once uh. Once Twizzle changes the, uh, he's he's changing settings as it shows in the upper right. Once he changes the settings, then it'll go into a countdown of starting. And then once everybody readies up, you can select through the cars then. Oh, I thought we were doing a drift event. No, we got to do, see the way custom events work is you set up a series of races like a tournament and then you got to finish them all and then, then you can change the stuff. Gotcha. How many races are there? Uh, I think I think Twizzle has it set up as three races in a group. Is this the third of them or no? This is the second one, I think. Okay. Did I get enough points to take first place? I doubt it. Like, you get the points here, it says plus 20. And then it's going to slide away, and then it's going to show... The, like, it's almost like a tournament system, and it adds points up. Then we have online playlists. There's four types of online playlists. You have everything has a mix of all the disciplines in a very series of races. You play every race one at a time on this, and then you have a vetoing system to vote the track, the race types like you know racing, drift, checkpoints, just to name a few. You can veto one of those away, and you can also veto the track. And there's two different selections and different countdowns to do the voting for those. Like I said, everything is a mixture of all disciplines, all race types that are available in the game, except for a couple that are Global Challenge exclusive and exclusive to the single player, which is something like Overtake in Eliminator mode. Next, we have Racing. It is literally, like it says, it's pure racing. First to finish is the only way to win. Simple enough. Straight up regular racing. Then we have Alternative. There's races that reward you with scores and stills as much as speed, like it says. These are considered probably face-off, togs, which I don't know if toge is the, the correct pronunciation of it, but that's what I call it. So face-off, togs, I think checkpoints and drifts are a part of the alternative. And then you have hardcore where there's no flashbacks and there's full damage. 
I don't recommend it for a new player because obviously full damage you'll wreck your car more than you even want to do. <laughs> so what I like doing, I like doing everything. It's a mixture of all the disciplines. I, it's just what me and my friends play. And we're just going to jump in here. Okay, so we have Indianapolis Sport Circuit Tier 2. Now, I'll be honest, there's a couple cars I have here in Tier 2. All these performance cars, these are two Tier 2 DLC cars that I have. Some of you people might not have these. It's just extra DLC. That's all it is. These cars are already pre-tuned to a certain spec. You cannot edit them at all. And since we were talking about cars at the end of this clip here, I figured this was a good place to start with uh, car upgrades for, like, other cars and some other car discussions. So we will start that now. Here we go. Okay, a fact I can share with you. As you can see, Death in third place. He has a little icon by his car. This icon means that the car was from a previous tier and it's upgraded to this tier. There's also a blue plus sign. The blue plus sign, which no one has right now because no one has upgraded vehicles. The blue plus literally shows you that the person has at least one upgrade on their car with that blue plus sign, which, like I said, no one has in here because no one has upgrades. I mean, most cars, if you try to upgrade them to the tier above, usually there's still, like, no chance of keeping up with, like, anything that's, like, naturally that next tier. So you may upgrade it to tier 2, but it'll still be kind of slow compared to other tier 2 vehicles. But he upgraded that Hyundai from tier 1. That's a tier 1 car, and he upgraded it to tier 2. You can do that with these cars, but a lot of them I don't recommend it for because it's not a great benefit. Of course, I guess it, it can be a benefit until you are able to buy the other cars unless you have the car unlock DLC pack like I do. Or you have all the all the cars at the start of the start of at level 1, but you can't do upgrades to them until a certain level for each car, so in case anybody doesn't know, the Camaro Z28 in Tier 1 is practically the meta car for Tier 1. Yeah, this reminds me. At level 6, for the new beginners, one of my favorite cars in Tier 1 is the Camaro Z28. It's practically the Agera of Tier 1, as a lot of people like to call it. Now, at level 6, you unlock upgrades for it. There's two main tunes for this car that a lot of people use, and that is two engine, zero drivetrain, and two handling. Then there is also one engine, one drivetrain, and three handling, and that's the one I've been using for over a year now, personally. So I'm going to rock at. I should have enough money to do it now. I should. Keyword should. And with that tune... I'm just barely under tier 1, as you can see. Here, I'll do this. There's actually a couple people that I, a friend, a couple, like one friend of mine actually redid the, uh, there's a community guide for the game that he made. And it has a, like a bunch of different tunes that you can do. This is the tune I prefer for the Z28. This is a tier 1 car still. As you can see, I didn't top over tier 2, so technically it's still tier 1. level 14 so I should be able to upgrade one of my main cars I use in tier 2 is the Camaro SS I run this thing with a 203 upgrade tune 2 engine, 0 drive train, 3 handling this is personally my favorite tune for this car there is other ones but this is the one I like the most, it just handles so well through turns with this tune and you can adjust mid drift with it so much that's kind of insane, so... <laughs> what do we got? Tier 2. Apparently I just have BMW performance. BMW 1 Series performance data. I don't have with the Camaro SS, which is usually what I use. I run this car at a 203 tune. Um, I, I, I just really like the handling of this car. It's not the fastest car in the game. Usually the C63 Mercedes. It's probably arguably the fastest car in tier 2 but 
I think people, most people run that thing three zero two three engine zero drivetrain two handling. I think, at least that's what I used to run it before I decided to stop using it. Because that car is so, it seems like it's heavy in the game. So when you steer it, you drift through a turn. Sometimes you can't recover it out of the turn, and you go smacking into the sidewall. And it, it, it happened to me enough times that I was like, I need to find a new car to drive. So. Is the GTR good? The GTR's in the right hands. It's pretty good. Hey, fairy. The GTR is pretty grippy. It's not the fastest thing in the world, but I'm that weird person that really likes using drift cars in this game. So I I don't have much experience with the GTR, so I can't really give a great like opinion on it. To be completely honest with you, so. Oh my God, he's using a Ute. Tip. Tip to you, folks. Don't use the Ute. It sucks. It's a very bad car in this game. And it doesn't drift worth a damn either. <laughs> now it's time for a segment of talking about the Conan Sega Gera R, which it's probably the fastest car in Grid 2. It's also probably one of the hardest to control, and I try my best to give some tips on how to drive it. And this is one of those situations, like I talked about at the beginning of the video, that I had multiple takes at saying certain things, and I just decided to keep them all because I couldn't decide between them. So, here we go. Jesus, this thing, this thing has so much top speed, it's ridiculous. Oh, I used a handbrake and I shouldn't have. I'll get out of his way. See that car's this car's tricky with handbrake and in that situation I didn't really need to use it. I kinda used it as another brake and it didn't really work. There, see I braked a good bit ahead of time. You see how much more nicer it made that turn for me? Ooh. Especially with this car, it requires you wanna hit something without like losing control through a turn definitely feel like you gotta use this thing's brakes more than you realize. Of course, its brakes aren't very great either. Of course, it's like stopping it from like 400 kilometers an hour down to like probably at least i say at least 220 kilometers or so. So It's a lot of braking you have to use. Maybe it's even lower than that, honestly. No, actually, e-brakes really bad to use with the Agera. To be honest with you, I wouldn't use the e-brake hardly at all with the Agera. I'll be honest with you, it's rough. The e-brake is not what you should use with that Agera. <laughs> yeah, you're driving wrong. It's so sensitive by itself. Like, you literally, if you want to take a turn with it, like, I almost feel like you've got to baby it around every turn. Like, don't go so fast. Go about, like, a... Try to do mental math here. Go about 200 kilometers an hour with it through a turn, I think, is if my conversion's right. I always remember going, like, 120, 130 miles an hour with it. So that'd be, like, 200 kilometers, I think. No, with the Yagera is one of them cars you can't really push full throttle a hundred percent of the time, especially through turns, because it's just never again. <laughs> it, I'm telling you, man, it's it's a car. It's really hard to control. It's all about throttle management, and not pushing full throttle all the time. It, at least the way I drive it. But there's people that are much better at it than I am driving it. But it's one of them things where when I take turns, I don't push full throttle as I'm taking the turn unless it's like a turn that I absolutely need to drift on. So many corner cuts, you poor thing. That's awful. That's what I said. If you can control the throttle on that thing, you'll be pretty successful with it. It's not always about going full throttle through turns either. If you go by like half throttle or no throttle at all, it will help you in most situations. But you also want to make sure you don't turn on the stick super aggressively, because if you do, it will spin out too. Kind of do more of a subtle adjustment as you take a turn, depending on the turn, of course, too. But 
Okay, now we are going to show the segment talking about different things involving the waiting screen or the lobby screen of the multiplayer lobbies. And we're going to show some other stuff as well. It's not even worth trying to vote kick them. Vote kicking system doesn't work in playlist lobbies at all. It doesn't work. We can vote them out, but in five seconds later they can rejoin like nothing happened. Custom events are the only ones where the actual vote kick system works. These online playlists, nope, they don't work at all. It acts like they work, but it doesn't actually physically ban a person from the session. They can just rejoin. We won't find out what the next track is until everybody comes back from the race event. All these uh, red light... I just want to call them rims. I know people call them rims. Some people call them wheels. <laughs> if they're present and you can see them, that means they're still in the actual racing lobby and didn't come back to this central main lobby area. So there's some people here that, you know, we joined in and we don't have it, including myself, because I just joined in, so... Yeah, the exclamation marks are impact ratings. No, the best you can do is white. White is the most cleanest you can be. They determine, in greater detail, they determine an impact rating, like I said. Whether you're clean or you cause wrecks and crash and affect others. There's, I think, five different colors. There's white being the cleanest. Then it's green, yellow, orange, and red being the most severe. And the thing that I found out about Red from a friend that tried to get Red just to see what it would do, he literally said when he got Red, the game would literally control his car if he tried to hit another person or he got near him. It would literally steer him away. Like, it controlled his car, like, to a degree. It was kind of crazy when he told me about it. Also, just wanted to mention this, since I noticed I didn't talk about it in this clip, is that there's also a impact rating bonus at the end of every race that gives you a little bit of extra money, depending on, you know, the color of your badge after every race. So, the cleaner you drive, you get a little, you know, more money after every race, so that can be useful, you know, down the line, building up money to buy upgrades or buy a car or something too so well no problem he's no longer in the lobby see how he doesn't have an, a circle around his name that means he's no longer in the lobby it means he left so hopefully you don't have to deal with him anymore now we're gonna jump into the video segments where I briefly talk about the leveling system I also talked about some game mechanics and some on-screen indicators that you may see as you're racing or if you're in the lobby still. How does the leveling system work in this game? Honestly, you get XP and you level up. And level scales based on it, other people in the race. The amount of people in a lobby, what kind of lobby you're doing, what the race you're doing is, gives more or less XP as well. I mean, I could go more in depth at a different time too, but... But more or less, it, that's the basis of the leveling system. And if you have a certain... If you don't have any DLCs, the cars literally unlock at certain levels. You have to purchase them. And then literally after the unlock level of the cars, literally two levels afterwards, you can put upgrades on them. In the online session, anyway. There's also a feature in the game called flashbacks. And a lot of people don't seem to understand what those are as well. That it literally resets you on the track after you crash. And if people would use it ahead of time, like after they mess up, they wouldn't mess up so many other people in the process, too. But, I mean, they the only reason why they don't know about it, I would say, is probably because they never played even like the first hour of the, the main single-player storyline thing of the game. Because in, like within the first hour... You, you, it literally tells you how to use them. Of course, the function of the flashback is kind of similar, but in single player, you can actually like completely rewind the part of the race to rewind it to a point that you would want it. And online, it literally just resets you. 
Here goes nothing. 41 seconds. That that's accurate compared to the other one. So wow. Uh, well, it's already starting off bad. I got a tire in front of me. When you're hitting an object in this game, it literally will make the camera shake like crazy. Sometimes I wish you could turn it off, but sometimes I'm literally so used to it, it doesn't even bother me anymore. You don't know if the person behind you is literally five seconds behind you or literally right on your bumper unless you look. But once, you, once people get close enough to you, though, you will see like a little white arrow come off the bottom of the screen. And that will show that they're very close to you. Yeah, there's a finish line. We're about halfway through the event. If you look at where the mini-map would be, there's an outer red line going around it. And that kind of just shows you the progression you are in the event. Essentially, the length. See, we just hit practically the halfway point. See, he tried to target me. But what people don't realize, another mechanic of this game, if I lead lap you, you turn invisible. You can't hit me no more. <laughs> Actually, I don't even think the per like fairy behind me, he's invisible to him too. Because I led lap to person, that person's also invisible to everyone behind me as well. So, him trying to wreck people is not going to work. <laughs> Okay. The guy does realize if you drive in reverse, you're invisible, so you can't hit other people. Oh, he found out now, didn't he? Yeah, sure. Any questions you have, I'll try my best to answer them. I can't say I have the greatest answer, but I will try my best, man. I don't mind questions at all. They are welcomed here. You know why some people just randomly ghost through each other? Well, there's times where, depending on how the race is going, um, I think it's all about the connection to the server at times. Like, it will make people ghost. But then I think there's also cheats that allow it, like, to allow you to control the ghosting. But if it, the ghosting happens, like, say you're in a time attack event, okay? And you're running through the time attack, and you catch up to the last place person. Like, you're, you're, you can lead lap him. Once you lead lap that person, he is literally ghosted for the entire people behind you. So if you're in first place, you ghost a person, you lead lap him. Well, you lead lap him, and they become a ghost instantly as soon as you lead lap them. And because you led lapped them, that person literally is invisible to everyone behind you as well. And they never turn unghost unless they pass you again but depending on your situation i don't know it also depends on who it was you, you were racing against i mean the ghosting thing can be unfortunate some people use it to their advantage sometimes their internet's so crappy it allows them to go through people so hopefully that answers your question i'm sorry if it's not the greatest answer because I wasn't in the race to see what happened, so it's kind of hard to make me guess at what it, it was that happened. Good job, fairy. Oh, lag. What? Lag? <laughs> no, that lag's caused by me. See, when you deselect out of the game, like, I have two monitors, and I'm doing stuff on the other monitor. <laughs> no problem, Fairy. When I'm doing stuff on my other monitor, for some reason, Grid 2 literally drops to, like, 20 frames per second, and it makes it extremely laggy looking. It's one feature I wish they would fix, but, uh, they're not. <laughs> they're not going to fix it. It's alright, you know, it's, it's alright. The one sucky part about this game's in-game chat and its overall audio settings, I can't adjust so I can hear him better. And the engine sounds and sound effect sounds of the game, you can only lower them to 50%. You can't adjust them any more than that. Okay, now we're going to talk about using brakes for turning and also talking about how handbrakes can be dangerous to use depending on the car or they can be 
pretty useful depending on the car and the turn that you're taking. So enjoy. As you saw there, that guy did not slow down at all. What he doesn't realize is a lot of these turns actually need a decent amount of braking to take them. <laughs> he went full force and then he braked so late it was too late. Into the kitty litter he goes. So I'm just trying to wean my way through this group of people too. I'm trying to be careful. That guy just went way too fast in the turn and hit me and another guy. This game is not all about speed. Like, don't get me wrong, it's a racing game. Of course it's about speed. But you, you don't realize how much you need to use your brakes going into a turn either, which is kind of crazy to say, but it's arcadey, but it's not that arcadey, so to speak. Oh, he straight, he, he used his handbrake too intensely there. He spun himself completely out. Also, if you drive the NSX with upgrades, be very careful using the handbrake with this car. Enough said. It, it'll practically drift by itself literally as you steer it. So literally 90% of the time you don't need the handbrake anyway. Seems like that guy tried to use the e-brake on this car. The Honda, the Honda NSX, it's very, very picky about the e-brake, so. But it also looked like he held it too long, so it literally phoomed him the whole way out, too, so. Ah, that was a screw-up. On that, I literally used a handbrake so I could somehow make that turn. It was kind of sloppy. Let's goof that up. He took it a lot better than I did, it looks like. Talking about that handbrake literally saved my life through that. I knew I caught that corner too sharp. I held the handbrake and it's like literally my car just stopped going like closer to the wall. It just kind of held out. It's kind of crazy. Now I am going to show the videos talking about how aggression is not rewarding in most situations and how sometimes just being a little patient and just waiting a little bit can help you avoid collisions or even have a better passing opportunity in the future of that race, whether it be one turn from now or maybe two or three. I'm going to back off, give this guy room to take his turn, because if I would have did see... If I would have slowed down, he would have kept his speed higher, probably rammed me, and we would both would have crashed. But by me slowing down, it gives him the space, gives me the space. No collisions. Helpful. Hashtag clean racing. Just spun out five times by... Yeah. My tip for you as well. Like, I, I might have said it earlier, too. When you're leading people into a turn... I, in all honesty, sometimes I go completely passive because I'm afraid of colliding with them. Because they could be taking a turn, lose control, and spin right in front of you again. So usually I back off, give them the space, run, they run their drift or their turn, and you find the opening. And usually that's one way to avoid collisions. A lot of times when you're racing this game, be patient. You never realize how sometimes in the right opportunity you will get a moment to pass. There we go. There's a little cleaner through this section compared to the first lap. You know what? It's too risky to go for this pass right here. I'll go for it on this turn, hopefully. Yep, there it is. Sometimes it's not best to go for the pass on the straightaway because as the turn approaches you, you're going to have to slow down anyway. Most times, depending on how much you slow down, will probably cause the person behind you to ram you anyway because they don't understand you had to break a pretty decent amount for some of these turns, so. Of course, I'm one of the people that's kind of probably too brake heavy, too. Probably use it more than I actually need to, but. It's better doing it the opposite direction, but. Okay, bud. You see, I didn't get to talk about this yet. See, the more you play this game, the more you should realize that aggression does not get you wins, and it doesn't benefit you at hardly at all. As you saw, that guy tried to take me out because I passed him. Well, you saw what happened to him 
Yeah, it's like, it screwed him up more than it screwed me up. He thinks it's gonna affect me more, but it affected him more. So thus, he literally had a pretty good position in this race, and he just threw it all away just because of me passing him. So, aggression does not get you wins. And I say that wholeheartedly, it does not get you wins. Okay, now it's time to talk about the different race types in Grid 2, and to give some tips about each race type. I'm going to start with time attacks, mainly because regular races make sense. <laughs> and I also decided to put in this one segment from when a Twitch viewer asked me about which tracks have longer straightaways on them, mainly so he could test top speeds on the cars that he was upgrading and whatnot, so... Last place, time attack. In case anybody's new in these, nice one tip I can give you about time attacks, especially if you start in the back, you could actually hang back <laughs> and let more people get more distance in front of you, then go for at least one good lap. This may sacrifice your last lap, but it might at least let you get at least one good one, and that's all you need in a time attack is one good lap. So if I hang back, Obviously, don't completely stop moving, but drive slowly or something. And then, I'd say probably go in like a little bit here, maybe. It all depends on the track and the people you're racing with and stuff determines probably how much distance you should put, but... Sometimes, depending on the track, if it's short enough, you can wait until the first person... First place... Pers bleh, the first place positioned person in the lineup passes you you become invisible to everyone boom you can go as long as you don't pass them back you'll stay invisible to everyone else and you just run through your race i just realized this is time attack i could hang back which i might just do it sacrifice here we go in case anybody doesn't know if you start towards the end in these time attack events you can actually kind of hang back Either let people pass you if it's a short enough track, or give yourself enough space just to run a run. And hopefully you can run at least one clean lap doing this. The only problem is, is depending on the length of the track, you could sacrifice your last lap. But hopefully, within one of the other laps you would have in this example, lap two, you hopefully run a very good lap to put yourself towards the top of the leaderboard. What track has the longest straights for testing top speed? That would probably be one of the if you guys if you're one of the people who got the humble bundle deal, there's a track, it's called Spa Fran Core Champs, I think it's called. I, I'm probably butchering the living crap out of the pronunciation, but there's an insanely long straightaway on that track. But it is a DLC track though. And uh, these lobbies that we're racing in currently, they don't have you never see them in here because for some reason it, it, it excludes them from the lobby and I'm not really sure why. Yeah, like Razor Point there. I don't know how... I'm probably pronouncing pronouncing the living crap out of it wrong. I'm, I'll, I'll be honest, I started pronouncing names of things. <laughs> so I'm probably pronouncing it extremely wrong, but... But yeah, that track that Razor put in chat there, that's the correct track that I'm talking about. Also, uh, Mount Panorama, I think it's, that's how it's pronounced. I, like I said, bad at pronouncing names of tracks. That's another great one. It has a really, really long straightaway as well. I would say do one of them two tracks. They have great straightaways on for testing top speed. Yeah, yeah, Mount Panorama is also a DLC. That's correct. I guess maybe I didn't mention that. My bad. But yeah, it's a, it's a DLC as well. All right, everybody, now we're going to talk about face-off and toad events, and I also decided to throw in a couple clips talking about shoulders on the side of the road and how dangerous they can be, which for some reason in the one clip, I could not think of what, I couldn't think of the word shoulders, so I called them lifted edges for some reason, but anyway, here you go. <laughs> because in face-offs, you only race, you race, you get set in groups, groups of two, Kind of highlighted as I am with my cursor thing here. Essentially, you do groups of two and you verse each other. 
Face off, you run the whole track. Toad event, you run until at least f somebody is five seconds ahead, and whoever's five seconds seconds ahead or completes the race wins. Completes the race in first place, I guess I should say, to be more clear. One side effect, though, is as you can see, I'm trying to be kind of passive on looking for this pass. It's mainly because if you collide with your opponent that you're racing, sometimes one of you can get disqualified for the collision. The only weird thing about this game during face-off and toad events that I've noticed, it's been like that for a while, like if you're ra if there's other people racing and are like along the same level you are, if they hit a sign, it, it, it hits the sign in your game too, it's really weird. So thus somebody could hit a sign in the other race and then it affects you because they hit it. It's so broken, it's weird. <laughs> it's practically a toad event, except between the difference between toad face-off events on these point-to-point -point tracks and then regular races is on face-offs, you're lying perfectly al beside each other. and race events, you're like staggered, like first place and second place. So... Yeah, see, like, he's staggered behind me a little bit. So, practically, I started off in the face-off, uh, the optimal, like, face-off positioning there. And everybody meet Jack Green. In case you don't know, if you do a face-off or a toad event, the person that doesn't have a person to race against, they give you an AI driver named Jack Green. And the crazy part about Jack Green is, is say if I finish the race or something, and then like th almost 30 seconds go by, you know, because of the countdown timer to finish, somehow before it hits zero, he will somehow get to the finish line and get a time. Just because apparently you can't DNF the AI driver. It's just really, really weird. Level up. Nope, not enough. See, it's weird. Face-off and toad races don't give you as much XP. Drift events, checkpoints, and there's always a third one I always forget. I think it's... Maybe endurances? They give you a little more XP per race. It's weird. I don't understand why. Don't ask me. I don't know. Let's see how everybody else is doing. Pokey with the BMW E30. Ooh. Bad thing about that bridge is if you hit this little lip here, I don't know if I can show it with him blowing smoke, this lip here, it's essentially like you hit a banana peel sometimes and you'll spin out of control. So if you ever find yourself on the sides of these roads where these lifted edges are, back off your gas. Usually pushing on the gas makes it worse and will likely cause a spin out. My little tip to you, which actually was very convenient because we started watching him and it Gave a perfect opportunity to give that little tip. Another thing that, like, on that last turn I just took with the Corvette, I hit the shoulder, like the, the uh, red and white, white stripes, and actually the car actually started slipping like it wanted to pull me into the grass. I backed off the gas, so literally it won't, it'll prevent it from pulling it as much. Literally, because I backed off the gas on that one shoulder section, that is literally what saved me from not going into the grass on that one turn. Okay, see? I got that turn too sharp, hit the part of, like, the lip into the turn, and it spun the whole Corvette out on me. That's one thing you gotta be careful about when you take a turn super sharp. Because it's not always the best idea. I mean, you want to cut it as sharp as possible, but... There's a point there that it's like a fine line you have to somehow find, find so to speak, so that doesn't happen. Okay, everybody, now we're going to talk about endurances and live routes. So here we go. But now it just became worse because it became a live route. And essentially, if no one knows about live routes, essentially they are an a type of endurance race that literally you run for five minutes in this case. And the track is randomly generated. You have no mini-map. You don't know how the track is going to be generated at all. Eventually, you start to notice a pattern of the way it generates, though. And you can sometimes predict how it's going to generate, but sometimes it'll throw you off, too. <laughs> 
so. Also looking at these these arrow indicators are very helpful in certain turns as well, because if you don't see them, then you have no idea if you're going to have like a sharp left turn coming up. Sharp hairpin. Sharp hairpin. Saw it coming. He's approaching. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is as you're approaching that straightaway before it, you can actually see the, like, arrows pointing up. You can see the arrows appearing like that it's going to the left, but you never know how sharp it is. Nice thing about live routes is in tracks like Dubai, you would have like a guardrail right where I'm driving. But in live or er, live routes, in, I think endurance races in general, they completely take out that middle section. So it's like it's something you don't have to worry about, which is really nice. So you can kind of really push hard and drive fast and stuff. I mean, to a certain degree without losing control, of course. You got to somewhat be careful with how you drive too, because... You'd be amazed how uh, much you can lose control with some of these cars. So because of that, I probably brake more than I probably should. But I also don't spin out as much and I don't hit walls as much, I guess. Alright everybody, now we're going to show all the videos involving drift events. And some tips between a couple of the different drift tracks. And I also have a rough, like, analysis breakdown thing of me doing a drift in one of the events, too. So, enjoy. But essentially, drift events give you more XP than other events. I know for a fact drift does. Of course, the amount of people in a lobby also determines how much XP you get. And the thing I don't like, it's just a progress bar. It doesn't show you the, the actual amount of XP you've earned. Which is kind of a weird feature. I'd rather see actual physical numbers for that. So, but that's just my opinion on the fa on the moment. So, in case anybody doesn't know, with drift events, if you start towards the back in one of these, like one of the last couple positions, you can actually go across the starting line, turn around, and you can waste a little bit of time back here doing donuts, doing whatever. You won't did get disqualified right away. As you see the little X above the mini-map, if you keep going in reverse, you will get disqualified eventually. Essentially, I can sit here and do donuts for a, a little bit here and give myself space and other people's space to do their drifts. But you also got to keep an idea on the upper right corner how much time you have left. Some tracks take longer to go through than others, so thus you can run out of time pretty quickly. Alright, one of my favorite drift tracks in this game, this is Infield Circuit, and it's also on Tier 3, which is the best drifting tier in my opinion. For the new viewers, the new players of Gri or Grid 2, one tip I give you for this track is when you take the last turn in this track, there's a little patch of grass. You hit that little patch of grass, it will give you an off track and you'll lose every single point you earned on that turn. So, when you're doing that last turn, which is, it's a right, it swoops around. Steer out of your drift so you get your points. Until you get more familiar with how the game plays. I hate that, see, uh, that's the part I hate about this track. I hate it. There's a little strip of grass right at the end of that track. And if you touch it, it counts as an off track. And I just lost like 200,000 points because of it. Yeah, that Sierra, it does not have much top speed. It's it's pretty slow on that. So is the Evo X, the Z, what was it? 370Z. The R30, one of the R32s has a decent amount of top speed. But those other ones, those are like drift spec cars and they just don't have the the um I don't have the top speed that you need any recommendation on a track and car to practice drifting in grid 2 on um I mean I don't know what you have DLC wise so I would say uh infield circuit for on Indianapolis is really nice it's like arguably one of the most 
popular drift tracks in the game, I, in my opinion. I like it the most. It's flat and gives you a lot of room to work with stuff. Now, depending on what tier you're talking about, we will determine what car I recommend as well. Tier 3. I don't know if you have the Drift Pack DLC or not, but that, that DLC pack is super useful. It has like the Evo X on it. It has a 370Z or Z as some people call it. It also has the Tyler McCrary Camaro SS, which is also very solid at drifting. And it has, I think like an S, what the hell was it? 240 SX, I think, in there too, which is pretty solid. They're all tuned to drift, so it's really nice too. Yeah, but like in field circuits, really nice. And depending on what DLC tracks, there's actually a Spa Francor Champs drift track. It's DLC. It's it's pretty solid drift track too. Like I think there's an achievement for it to get like over. 300,000 points on one of the turns for it. it's an achievement. I don't know if you have that DLC or not. But in base game wise, I still think Indianapolis infield circuit is probably arguably one of the better drift tracks. I can't remember what the other one is. It's in Okatama. I think it might be Tenchi Way. It's like two minutes. It gives you two minutes to run it. Obviously, you don't use the two minutes, but it's it's higher than what the user usual standard time for drifting is which is like a minute and a half so 1.1 mil i'll take it as a first run attempt there it's all about the, i mean it is kind of rough for racing but that one section which i can show in replay now i think about it this section is literally all about setting this up just right like, as you approach this thing, you kind of try to aim for the pole, but you don't really go so hard into it that you lose your drift. But as you can see, I'm kind of like kind of going with it. But this car is just one of those cars like it holds the drift so well. Because, you know, if I, I if I would have cut that too wide, I would hit the guardrail. If I cut it too narrow, I would have been about right here and then I would have lost my drift. So, to be fair, right he right about here. I was actually holding the handbrake to keep the drift going. What is up with that audio glitch? Listen to that audio glitch. What is up with that audio glitch? That must be the that must be me hitting the handbrake and the engine like revving like crazy. This one you essentially start the drift and you just kind of hold it a little bit like. You don't really have to adjust. Like, with the way this car handles, you don't have to adjust a whole bunch with it. Like, literally, I set up the drift, and I went straight. Literally, the wheels are straight right now. And then I adjust occasionally. There's an adjust. There's an adjustment. There's an adjustment. <laughs> this one, you try to... It's like you kind of aim for the... You aim for the cliff, kind of, but you also want to cut this tight enough that you get this multiplier. Then once there, you kind of just try to hold it out. I mean, this car is really good at holding the drift out with. It's easier to do, but that's a random breakdown. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, my school of drifting is very basic because there's a lot of racing terms I don't understand or don't know, but... Shall, shall we try it with the Evo next? The Evo is another car that literally your drift angle doesn't have to be like super sharp for it to keep the drift going. Because of that, it makes it easier to do drift events with. Of course, Tier 3 is the best tier, or the best tier for drifting, so. Ah, hit it again. Dang it. Because that first turn was pretty solid. Like, literally, I set up the drift and didn't have to adjust my stick at all afterwards. There's a time six. There's a time six. See, I lost. See, I lost the angle, and I lost how much I was drifting there. So it screwed me. Or other than that, that would have been an insane run. Yeah, that's that's a very 
big part about it is getting the right correct entry speed. It's kind of one of them things. Sometimes I might take the turn slower than I need to, and that probably what happened on that last turn there with the Evo. I took it too. I took the angle probably too sharp with not enough speed, so thus the drift ended too early. Okay, now we're gonna show off some things involving checkpoints. So here we go, dude. I'm in like tenth place. Tenth place. <laughs> Oh, I'm in 12th place, never mind. But what I could do, is since this is one of those standing start checkpoints or whatever you want to call it, you can sit back, like you said, it's time to sit back. You can sit back behind the starting line for about 10 to, 10 to 13 to 15 seconds. I wouldn't do 15. I think that's where it will DNF you, but... You can sit here for at least 10 seconds, and then once you start that starting, cross that starting line, you get the time to go. You get the distance, the time, the counter, whatever you want to call it. I don't even know what you want to call it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We'll try this. This usually doesn't, depending on what kind of lobby you're in, this could work. This could not work. Of course, it could be one of them things that I'll have to look at that check or that global challenge event. It could have gave, given me more time to start off with because there's times where global challenge will give you more or less time, usually more, more time than a regular online lobby would. It also depends though, but. Fifty-three seconds, I think it was. Start with 59 seconds on global. Exactly my point. Sometimes global will give you more time to do checkpoints. That guy just literally ran out of time on his checkpoint, so he literally turned invisible because of that. He just literally ran out of time as I was catching up to him. Oh, I got really lucky I got that checkpoint. There's a certain part you can hit that checkpoint smoke at, and it kind of makes it easier to enter that turn, but as you can see, you get really close to not getting the checkpoint at all and completely missing it. This is like a sweet spot right where you can get it. Okay, towards the beginning of this video, I t briefly talked about overtake events, which are a global challenge event. And I said in that section that I would talk about them later. Well, now I'm going to interject the videos for that now. So here we go. Right, overtake. Anybody's new to overtake races in this game? Essentially, you pass a bunch of moving trucks and you gain points by passing them. But you also can't collide with them. You also cannot hit walls or run off the track. Or you will get penalized and have to start all over with your point gain. In other words, these could these kind of races can be the most like triggering, upsetting kind of races to do. Just because of how they can go. And if you don't run your line right, you're just gonna run right into the back of a pickup truck too. Like I'm about to almost do there. <laughs> I learned from last time he changes his route. But the problem with overtakes is the lineup of the trucks always is different. It's never always the same. That's another thing it sucks about it. So even with muscle memory, you can't learn how they're going to spawn. Because they change. In the upcoming clips, I show off various situations where corner cuts can be given to drivers. I also analyze another driver that was driving in front of me during this one race. And I also give an example of my thought process during a race. Actually, guys, let me know what you guys think about this. 
might make a video based on my thought processes and my decision making when racing if you guys are interested i think it'd be kind of a cool concept for a video maybe i don't know it's just an idea as i'm thinking and editing and whatnot <laughs> but anyway guys enjoy And that's exactly why I did not line up perfectly on the racing line. You see that? What just happened? That's exactly why I didn't line up on that racing line. <laughs> He's gonna get a corner. Oh, he didn't get a corner cut. He'll get one. No, he still didn't get one. I thought he'd get one coming back in there. I guess he was going slow. It's weird, this game, like, it'll give you corner cuts, but if you drive it slow enough, Sometimes you can get your, you can cheat your way out of a corner cut because you drive so slow and the game's like, oh, he's not doing any harm. <laughs> this is like, okay, whatever you say, grid two, whatever you say. And if that guy doesn't come back in, he's going to get a corner cut. Ta-da, told you. If you stay in that outside area after taking that turn too long, you will indefinitely get a corner cut. Absolutely. I swear, I don't think it even matters how fast you're going as you cross back onto the track. I'm pretty sure every time it'll give you a corner cut. Go for that inside pass. I got lucky. Just in that patch of turn at the end there, if you cut it two inside on the right and start running over that grass, it's a corner cut nine times out of ten. So I was kind of afraid of that. Thankfully, I never had to touch it to do that. I was waiting for him. When he came in, he's going to get a corner cut. Yep. He stayed on the outside line too long. It'll give you a corner cut every single time you do that. That's, that's cool, boy. You keep swerving around, I'm going to get you. Yep, you're going to get a corner cut as soon as you come right back in. Yep, told you. He went way too fast into that first turn. Because of that, he took it so wide that he got off track, and I knew he was going to get a corner cut as soon as he came back in. Because it's a mix between running off the track and the amount of speed he had trying to get back on the track that gave him the corner cut. Of course, you got to be careful. Like what he did, he stayed on that outer shoulder too long, and it'll give you a corner cut if you do that. That's a kind of the strange part about this track, but that corner in particular, if you cut the inside of that back turn back there too, just a tiny bit. It will give you a corner cut, and I'm guessing that's what happened to Skyler here. And the guy that was driving the Adam didn't realize it was going to happen either. He got caught up behind him when it did. I Tao should have took the outer side line there. It would give more space to whip there. Since of that, he had to cut the corner so sharp, and it really made it awkward for him. Hey, what? I don't need to push that hard for this pass. I'll let him have it for the time being. He's going to get a corner cut. Yep. See, if you stay in that area where he just was too long, it'll corner cut you as soon as you come back in. See, he stayed in that area too long. He needs to come back into the track quicker or he will get a corner cut like he did. I don't know how this guy's going to be. I'm just going to stay behind him. Wait for a better passing opportunity, which is right there. Might be the same with Panda here. Might try to wait for this turn coming up. 
Yeah, he held his handbrake way too long there. He's going to get a corner cut. Yep. I saw that coming. So I, I actually backed off on the gas on purpose. Because if I would have followed him real close, I would have ran right into him because he got a corner cut. All right, everyone. The last set of clips are involved with racetrack layouts and some discussion of turns on various tracks. Just like the idea of the decision-making video, I feel like things like this could make for an interesting future video. Let me know what you guys think. We could make a whole separate video for these kind of things or just discuss these things in future streams. Let me know your thoughts. And while I'm at it, I just want to say thanks for watching this whole video in general. It's been a long time coming on editing this video. Like I said at the beginning of this video, I don't think I have ever done a video like this before. So I wanted to try it, and like I said in the beginning, I wanted to see what everybody's thoughts were, what kind of reaction I get out of it. So I just want to say thank you so much for your guys' time watching this video. This became a lot longer of a video than I originally imagined, but there was a ton of video clips <laughs> through seven months of streams. And these are what I selected, I guess. But uh, make sure to come hang out sometime or just say hello on a future Twitch stream in the future. That's the best place to interact with me and ask future questions if you have any. But anyway, guys, here we go. The last set of clips. Here we go. What? <laughs> what about that last turn? You like that? <laughs> How did I do that? <laughs> I don't know. You hit the rail every time. It's all about the entry into that turn. Sometimes it's better to slow down. And don't go into it as fast. It gives you more time to whip it. Like you saw, if you saw, I I didn't I don't think I went like full throttle into it. I like kind of cut my throttle. One second, opening Notepad. <laughs> yeah, you you can't go full full gas into that turn. There's no way. That's that's the key to that one. You you can't go full into that. It'll just bite you in the butt every time, every single time. <laughs> can't do it. Looks like a simple curve, and then it's sharper than it seems. Yeah, that is. It is, definitely. Definitely is misleading. It's sharp. But yeah, it's not all about full speed into that one. It, because you will go smacking off the, the signs and stuff on the outside rail and whatnot there. Well, the problem is, is if you do the left side, you're too close to the wall 90% of the time, and that's you usually go bouncing off that left side as you're taking that turn. So it's better to kind of go more on the right side, that way you have a little more room. Because if you don't, <laughs> you'll be bouncing off stuff. Yeah, but either hit the wall, or bump the wall, or hit the right wall trying to avoid... Avoid hitting the left wall. <laughs> I mean, if you're hitting the right wall, it tells me you're going into the turn too fast. But if you're hitting the left wall, then you're cutting the corner too too quickly as well. It's one of them things that I noticed that if you hit the turn, like if you literally, as you're approaching that turn, back off the, the throttle and just kind of don't go as full throttle through it, it, it helps a lot too. Cause you won't go as fast then too, so. I mean, I somehow squeezed my way through that tunnel turn. I thought I was gonna screw it up. <laughs> it's all about the approach, like I said, Twizzle. Sometimes it's better to approach it not at full speed too, because it allows you to line up your angle more. Like as you're approaching it, like after you do that last squiggle thing, start backing off the gas and kind of decide where you want to line up. Kind of go kind of slightly middle right on that turn and then kind of start pushing on the gas again as you start going around. And adjust accordingly. I mean, every car handles differently through that turn, but... I 
I thought about that turn too much. Screwed myself thinking about it too much. Any tips for that last turn? I mean, it's one of them turns you can't hit it at full speed. As you saw, I tried to back off. But as you also saw, I started taking the drift too early. And as I did that, I got too close to that inner wall and I hit it. But more or less, that turn requires... I guess you kind of line up more on an outer left side line and go through it. Yeah, you can't go too fast through there. You have to decelerate a little bit. You have to slow down. You can't go full throttle in it. At least in Tier 4, you can't go full throttle. Unless you really set it up well, then you could, but it's still too much. But the Agera... Talking about the Agera, though... The Agera is kind of one of them cars you can't full throttle it the whole time just because of the amount of power it has. It will slide. <laughs> Four wrecks, yeah. Barcelona is brutal, man. Barcelona is really brutal. Especially in Tier 4 for most people, too. It's one of them things, I feel like I'm driving kind of fast, but I'm also kind of trying to be conservative. As you saw in that, like, last section of turns, that, like, little weaving thing. I try to cut it, like, perfectly through the middle, but also when you come out of that second thing and you try to turn right a little bit, you can lose, like, your traction so bad there, it's really scary. <laughs> mm. Sharp right, 180 right turn coming up. It's all about entering this properly, because you'll be like him and do that if you go too fast. That, that going under that little bridge section, no matter if you're coming down and going that way or coming up this way, it's always kind of stressful on timing the turn up so you don't lose control going through there. It's 90% of the time it's like somebody put all the banana peels all around there and you just slide around in there. Especially if you go too th fast through that area, it will most likely spin on you or you'll lose control of the car or something like that will happen. This right turn coming up after this straightaway, you can't hit it at full speed or you will literally launch off the track. So I brake a little bit and then slide. That way I don't turn out like this guy just did in front of me where he got so fast, he got off to the left, he got off the road pretty much and got a corner cut. Because of that, you know, I got in front of him because of it. Literally, I slowed down so I literally wouldn't do what he just did. I mean, it's it's a risky, it's kind of risky. You could lose a bunch of speed doing it, but at least you're not like running off the road and essentially getting corner cutted. Because you can slow. Some people can hit that turn faster than I do. Because of that, you know, they can like really make up some ground. Now, I probably should push really hard for this, but if this is the track variant, I think it is. Literally, you go through a really, really narrow way. Like, you literally could weave through it, but you, if you cut it perfectly through the middle, it's the fastest way to do it. But because everybody pushing so hard, you squeeze a bunch of people in a very small area. So it becomes a living mess. It is this turn. As you can see on the mini-map, there's like a little squiggle together right here. See? Death. Death in front of me. Need a tip on how to hold a drift longer. You feel like you always overreact. I think it all depends on the car mostly, but... Yeah, if you want to suffer, choose a front-wheel drive car. That's true. But... I think it's one of them things. It's about initially setting it up for yourself. And then once you get in it... You can adjust for it accordingly, like if you start cutting the angle too sharply, obviously you're going to steer out of it, try to anyway. There's, depending on the turn, I'm constantly like going like this on my stick, like flipping back, 
forth between my adjustments because I feel like I overcorrect some and I kind of flip in. Sometimes I can actually hold it. A couple turns, I actually, if you line it up just right, the car will literally do the drift for you and you don't even have to move the stick and it'll just follow the perfect pathway. Z28 can do that on some turns. It's pretty amazing, honestly. I mean, Jim plays the game with a flight stick, so... <laughs> He'll be, I don't know, I can imagine what his gameplay is like this, like going. <laughs> yeah, my buddy Jim, he actually plays with a Sidewinder joystick. It all, like I said, it all depends on the car and the turn that you're taking, Zenvo. Some turns will allow you to literally, you take that turn, you literally not have, you don't even have to touch it at all. I think it's one one thing you got to be careful about with some cars. Don't push so uh, heavy on the throttle. Sometimes I cut like maybe 75, 50% on some turns because I know the way the car handles. It will spin out if I push too fully. The Agera is one of those unless... Obviously, Agera is one of those because how fast it is. But actually, there's times where you push on the gas more with the Agera and it will save you too. Yeah, handbrakes on U-turns are useful. Or something has a sharp angle. But a lot of the time, you can literally tap the handbrake. Sometimes, sometimes I just use the regular brake. It all depends on the turn and how sharp the angle is. On the more shallower turns, you can literally kind of tap your brake depending on the car and it will do the drift for you. If you need to make a mid-drift adjustment kind of aggressively, then you can tap the handbrake and allow it to whip a little more, but other than that, you don't really always need the handbrake either. It all depends on the turn. Like right there, that turn, I took it so wide, I started losing the drift. So I actually tapped the handbrake to get my angle going against, because sometimes a little bit of the brake on certain turns, depending on how you enter them, like in that one there, in that situation, literally a little hand handbrake tap was going to get me drifting again more than, like, a little brake tap would. See, this one was two brake taps I did just to try to control my speed into that turn as well. Absolutely, Zenvo. Don't always have the best answer for these questions, but I try my best, man. See, in that situation, if you saw my throttle on the on the uh, car there, I was probably like 50% there so I wouldn't spin the car out. Because this is one of those cars, if you full throttle like halfway through the drift, you will spin out. I mean, it's all just like how long I've been playing the game. Like, it comes natural. Like, see, I'm pushing on the right stick a little bit to make sure my angle doesn't completely go like this. So I'll tap on the right stick on certain turns. This time I'm holding the right, I'm holding the stick to the right so I can keep the angle. Every turn's different. There's actually, I discussed in a previous stream that I thought about, an, or like, analyzing literally turns I take, or passes that I do. And slow down the gameplay, talk about what my controller is doing do, during a certain drift, for example. I'm going for this pass, so what I'm going to do, I expect this person to go wide on this turn. I'm going to try to get the inside, so I'm going to go take more of an outside line to that approach of that turn, and then I'm going to cut it real sharp to try to get inside, for example. I started marking a couple clips to use, but honestly, I haven't got to the editing side of it yet. Just like I want to make a compilation of clean passes just because they're awesome, honestly. So, we got a left turn into a very sharp right. You have to slow down quite a lot for this turn. Or whip it just right, or you're going to get a nice corner cut like these two people did in front of me. I'm actually surprised I got around, because even though you're corner cutted, you can still move left or right, and a lot of people are kind of rude and try to block other people with it. <laughs> Essentially, you can line this up in a nice left and right swoop. Even though I still suggest either using a bunch of e-brake or slowing down a decent amount. That way you just don't go into that turn back there too fast. 
As you saw, it's only going like 120 kilometers an hour, which is not very quick. Of course, this is also tier one, so. But still, I don't even think I'd go that fast. I, don't, I probably don't even go that fast with, like, higher tiers either. It's just a really tight turn that you can't really take it a whole bunch of speed or you'll corner cut yourself one way or another on it. Also, you gotta watch your throttle control through that turn, especially if you do it like I just did with the e-brake. Because if you do too much throttle as, do, bleh, if you do too much throttle while doing that, it will possibly spin your whole car out too. So 